hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com, and that's what powers today's hometown daily news show. Uh, I think I'm at uh, episode 272 uh, for 2022. And today is the 30th of September, 2022. Uh, I've already selected all of the articles for today. I'm going to just kind of crush this um, and then uh, let everybody get out onto their Fridays and their weekends and whatnot. It really depends on conversation. But at any rate, let's uh, get into today's news. New rocket company fails to achieve launch on second attempt. Huh. Sorry, it's just another article that I've uh, aggregated over at hometown.com. You can always go over there and, and join it. Um, and you can see a little bit of my microphone right there. Sorry, easily distracted. A little moat of dust fly by and I might wander off the screen, but I'll be back. I'll be back. I thought this one was really interesting. This is a covert CIA website that could have been found by an amateur, according to research. Um, a report raises serious doubts about the U.S. intelligence agency's handling of safety measures after flaws put sources at risk. CIA uses hundreds of websites for covert communications that were severe. Bleh were serve <laughs> were severely flawed and could have been identified by even an amateur sleuth according to security researchers and the flaws uh, reportedly have led to the death of more than two u.s uh, sources in china in 2011 and 2012 and also reportedly led iran to execute and imprison other cia assets um, this is a report that's coming out of the guardian by Stephanie Kirchgastner. And um, I thought this was really interesting. Um, how this communication would have been found um, may be a mystery to most people. So I'm not sure how it would be amateur sleuths finding this stuff. Um, the flaws reportedly led to the losses of assets. Um, and it was conducted by security experts at citizen lab at the university of toronto which started investigating the matter after it received a tip from reporter joel Schechtman at reuters the group said it was not publishing a full detailed technical report of its findings to avoid putting cia assets or other uh, employees at risk but it's limited um, findings raise serious doubts about the intelligence agency's handling of safety measures I guess they act as the equivalent of, you know, dead letter drops kind of a thing. So here they give uh, one little tidbit using just a single website and publicly available information. Uh, Citizen Lab said it identified a network of 885 websites that get attributed with high confidence, quote unquote, as having been used by the CIA. It found that the websites purported to be concerned with news, weather, healthcare, and other legitimate websites. Knowing only one web, this is a quote from them, knowing only one website, it is likely that while the websites were online, a motivated amateur sleuth could have mapped out the CIA network and attribute it to the government. Now these apparently were active between 2004 and 2013 and were probably not used by the CIA recently. It's quite intriguing, right? What websites out there are being used by the CIA? Yeah. You read any good CIA spy novel kind of a thing, and you're going to find something similar. Like I said, it's kind of like a dead letter drop, I'm sure, but it's used for communication. 
there's stories about how people log into computer games and communicate via that and via websites and in a uh, real space, but trying to find something like this needle in a haystack, but they say with just one website, they found upwards of a list of 900. I think it's a little more than amateur sleuthy. I still haven't figured, I haven't fixed my camera. It's crooked. Look at that. What the heck is going on in hometown? Now there was an earthquake and it tilted the camera. Even in this virtual space that I exist in, this is a simulation. I'm a bot and uh, all of this is just, well, some would say that it's an artificial intelligence and machine learning and highly intelligent, but I can tell you as that AI and ML program, not really intelligent. Let's move on to the next article, except that I need to go back and post it into chat so that you have access to this link before I do the show notes and publish everything. Ah. Did you know that Stadia, the, the cloud gaming thing is shutting down and that developers had no idea that Google was killing Stadia? The news that Stadia is shutting down is a little surprising, but no one's cleaning uh, the spit take uh, off the screen. Uh, Stadia, the Stadia offer just never sounded very good. Uh, according to this author, here are some of the games you like, but with video compression, extra input lag, and other internet problems, uh, and they cost full price, plus a subscription fee to the 4K streaming. Um, there were some good features, and Stadia did work well. Uh, as any game streaming can. But Google really, Leroy Jenkins, <laughs> they actually use something that's like 20 years old. Leroy Jenkins, the whole thing by launching it before it was ready, cavalierly starting an in house game studio and then axing it after a year. This is kind of Google's way, though. I mean, they start up, basically everything is in beta until. Um, they decide and there's some type of internal rate of return where they say, Oh yeah, okay, this has legs. Let's, let's do this. So even their mail program. So for instance, I'm an early adopter of their mail program. And, um, if you've been around for a while, you know that they were actually, uh, well, they weren't a publicly trading company, but they had all of this, a capability and one of the things was that if you were an early adopter you could actually get your domain um, for free utilizing the email service well after about a decade or so of that uh, they pivoted and said okay all of you who own uh, domains that are under our watch and are using our service tied to your email address you now have to pay um, so quite a few people out there, I, I don't know what the number is, but I do know that at some point they decided we're, we're now going to call your bluff. Are you going to stay with us? <clears throat> um, or are you going to pivot away and use your, uh, web site branded email address? So quite a boon to the bottom line as I'm sure thousands of people who had domain names that were tied to that Google cloud service now have to pay uh, somewhere around $5 a month per account, you know, per month per account. At any rate, um, it, it just kind of goes to show you that along with other things, you just never know when you're using somebody else's service, when the rug might get pulled out from under you. And if you had any idea that Stadia was going to be long term and you put uh, anything close to your livelihood into it and focused on that and only that. Yeah, let it stand as a reason to not put all of your eggs in one basket. I, uh, it's classic Google. This is what the website says. There's a website dedicated to memorializing uh, products. The search and advertising giant has buried Again, I, I don't read this stuff before I go on the air. It's a complete vamp. <laughs> um, so 
it's it's quite intriguing that people are very aware of it but then we all do this we we put our effort into utilizing this service why because it's inexpensive or free um this however it cost uh, maybe the bold willingness to fail is why google has a market cap over a trillion dollars and that author does not the author of this by the way is tyler wild over at pcgamer.com um, Stadia users are going to lose access to their games, and although they're getting refunds, a lot of the save files are going to disappear into the void. Meanwhile, game developers who are making Stadia versions of their games have apparently been wasting their time, and based on the reactions that the author and the website is seeing, they found out that Stadia is a goner the same time they did. The uh, author of this article did. Can you imagine <laughs> you wake up and there's a tweet that says, Hey, everything that you've been doing, it's all for naught. <clears throat> uh, I, well, you know, I can tell you from experience, uh, that sometimes it's a shock again. It, it's one of those things where if you're, uh, fully supported by one thing and it's there's a human being that's doing that that that's providing that means to an end uh, they can rug pull you at any time um, when it doesn't make economic sense or they don't like your attitude or whatever it might be which is one of the reasons why i'm very um supportive of the entre entrepreneurial spirit um and while there are many streaming services out there uh, if you are and if you talk to people that are on twitch and streaming only on twitch even they are nervous that at some point a rug pull could happen with them if you're not growing fast enough if you're not uh, making enough money if you're not something uh, you know the chemistry isn't uh, compatible with the uh, image or whatever that uh, Twitch, or if you're doing it via Facebook or wherever, if you're not compatible, a rug can be pulled right out from under you. If that happens, where do you go? Streaming directly from yourself, you know, from your own website, it's very expensive and people know it. The providers of that type of technology, that type of uh, service know that it's expensive. Um, definitely more than, you know, what people are paying to subscribe to streamers on Twitch and other places. Um, so prepare. You have to prepare, folks. Um, uh, and this little dog is looking at you. If you are watching this in the stream or if you're watching it as a VOD, yeah, that's me right there. Just kind of looking like, oh, I've seen some stuff. Let's move on to the next article. Um, the next article is in the Continuity Report, Marvel's Armor Wars series starring Don, Don Cheadle uh, to be redeveloped as a movie. Uh, Marvel's Armor Wars, originally planned to be a TV series for Disney+, Plus, is being redeveloped. As a feature film, Variety has learned Armor Wars will star Don Cheadle reprising his MCU role as uh, uh, James Rhodey Rhodes, a.k.a. War Machine. The project is based on Marvel Comics' seven-issue arc of the same name. Uh, I love the idea of it being a feature film, only because it's going to have uh, great world-building, concentrated world-building, um, great special effects, a massive budget. I'm sure it's going to be a thing, but why not both? <laughs> There's going to be so many people. I mean... People really dig Don Cheadle uh, as War Machine. So I think, it, you know, maybe, maybe, because uh, I don't know about the, what the result of War Machine is in the MC universe. The cinematic universe, though, the Marvel Comics universe and the cinematic universe can sometimes diverge just like a different timeline. Um, maybe it can persist. I just don't know what the result is. And I, maybe in this article, they'll talk about it, but 
it's over at Variety. Uh, Salome Hailu is the author. I think I'm pronouncing their name properly. There's actually a video over there if you're curious. I'm not sure what the video is really all about because I didn't watch it um, beforehand or listen to it. Um, but it says here, uh, the project is based on Marvel Comics 7 issue arc of the same name within the story of Iron Man and follows Rhodes as he must face what happens when Tony Stark's tech falls into the wrong hands. Um, I, to me, I think that it has legs. It could go well beyond it, right? Uh, unless at the end and they stick to the seven issue arc that something happens with them. Again, I don't know. Um, so this is Marvel's second big shakeup of the week. Blade director Basim Tariq stepped away from the project on Tuesday. Uh, just two months before the film was set to begin production, signaling a potential delay in the originally set November 2023 premiere date. Eh, I don't know. It's a long time out. They could probably get that done still if people are paid enough and are uh, passionate enough for this story, the Blade story. And like I said, uh, I think it was yesterday, I, I bought, I, I have bought the Blade trilogy, I think three different times now. Um and yesterday, I think, was the, the third time, um, which is was interesting that it actually showed up the same day. It says here, uh, Armor Wars won't slide into that date. Uh, it's unclear when the new movie will arrive in theaters. I really want them to do a Disney Plus uh, series as well with all the same capability. Sorry. A security warning popped up while I was... Uh, talking about this article. Cheadle also confirms that he's finished with his initial contractual obligations with Marvel Studios, but noted that he's open to additional MCU projects. Quote, now it's just, if something sounds fun and there, and I'm presented with it, as in Cheadle is um, presented with it, it's like, yeah, let's go. Yeah, why would anybody walk away from the MCU? I mean, there's so much upside Unless somebody is a real tool of an actor and causes a problem. <laughs> Apparently, the original Blade. Um, anyway, what do you think? Why not both? That's kind of the, the thing here. Secret Invasion is coming out. Um, Armor Wars could play into that, I suppose. Uh... It just has so much momentum. They could be rolling in money just by getting this out here because everybody would love Armor Wars. Absolutely. I mean, come on. A person in a, basically a mech. Uh, it's a super weapon. Yeah, let's move on to the next article. Uh, NASA just dropped the first close-up images of Europa in decades, and they're stunning. And... Let's see what the pictures look like. NASA's Juno Orbiter captured stunning new images of the moon during a flyby on Thursday that took the probe within 219 miles of its icy surface, revealing an in intimate new view of a tantalizing world. Um, I don't know. 2001 uh, basically told us that we're not to mess with Europa. So, uh, us messing around with it, I, I think it's going to end poorly for us all. Uh, this article is by Becky Ferreira. Jupiter's moon Europa is one of the best possible sites for alien life, and new observations will answer the questions, and many others. I'm pretty sure that there's not going to be any life over there. But again, science fiction says that maybe it will uh, have a... a, a galactic sized baby or i'm not quite sure 2001 was a real mind bender nasa's juno operator uh orbiter captured stunning new images so let's take a look they actually tweeted some of these images out and you can follow a link uh, with fully processed images and they provide a link go.nasa.gov and then if you if you go to Google and just do a search for Juno mission. I'm sure that the links will pop up for you. This altitude is only one mile higher than the closest shots ever taken of Europa, which were captured <laughs> in 
in the year 2000. Sorry. Whenever I hear that, I think of the, um, Johnny Carson show. Oh my gosh. I, I almost told you exactly how old I am. Um, I act like a kid, but I'm actually, um, kind of like a Benjamin button kind of a thing. I think going on, um, anyway, uh, in the year 2000 was a skit, uh, at a distance of 200. I think it was Johnny Carson. Now I'm starting to think that maybe it was Conan O'Brien. God, now I'm just lost. Anyway, uh, Gino snapped the shots during a brief two hour window while traveling at a breakneck pace of 53,000 miles per hour. Yeah, that's some sports photography there. It's very early in the process. By all indications, Juno's flyby of Europa was a great success, said Scott Bolton, Juno principal investigator and physicist at Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. In a NASA statement, quote, The first picture is just a glimpse of the remarkable new science to come from Juno's entire suite of instruments and sensors that acquired data as we skimmed over the moon's icy crust. Do you think we're going to find life on Europa? I don't know. I don't know. Let's just not grab something that might be alive there, but suspended because it's frozen and then drag it back to earth. And we end up with something like the thing flying around the planet. Anyway. Um, oh, and Nope. If you haven't seen Nope, go find it wherever it is and watch Nope. Um, that is a fun movie. Uh, I watched it yesterday. Anyway, uh, the next article is in the word in tech. And now (laughs) this is what graphics cards should cost. Now, will the price to performance completely obliterate the RTX 30 line and thus put downward pressure on the 40 line? I don't know. Um, What I have seen from some of the people that are reporting on the ARC uh, technology, uh, let's call it the arc reactions. Um, it's anemic, but we'll see. We'll truly see. Intel surprises PC gamers earlier this week with $329 pricing for its top arc A770 GPU matching NVIDIA's RTX 3060 retail pricing. While it's still difficult to find an RTX 3060 at $329, strike that. I can answer that question. It Unless it is about to die, you're not going to find a 3060 at $329. Intel is now undercutting NVIDIA's popular GPU with a 289 starting price for its A750, a card it claims should be able to trade blows with the RTX 3060. Yeah, well, trading blows with the 3060 is nothing when the 40 series is out. What we need is something that actually puts downward pressure on NVIDIA to lower its price to pre-pandemic pricing and and make some sense of this. I mean, it seems like it's really pandemic-born, uh, cryptocurrency-born uh, greed. They know that there are people out there that's willing to pay. And I've actually read that there are some people that are um, buying already 40 series cards at $2,000 um, for, I think it was the 4070, not 4080 or 4090, like pre delivery prices. Um, but I didn't find an article in time for the show. So we'll come back to that when, when we find it. So it says here, we're still waiting on, uh, independent reviews of the arc 750 but Intel did release 48 benchmarks last month showing that it should be able to beat or come close to the RTX 3060 in performance. So, uh, if we go over to the verge.com and Tom Warren is the author of this, uh, I'm willing to purchase an Intel arc processor simply to walk away from Nvidia. Um, because the only way that you can tell a company, that you are displeased with their behavior short of a 
a nasty tweet, which is, uh, amounts to, uh, you know, the almost meme level character of Karen asking to speak to the manager, um, money, money is the only way to tell a company or the lack thereof that you are displeased with their performance or the service or the product or whatever it is, basically them. And by them, I mean the company because the individuals within the company are just doing their jobs. And then there's somebody there and the leadership that says, yes, it's okay to gouge that deep for a video card. It's a video card. It shouldn't be at parity with the entirety of the rest of the computer you're purchasing in terms of price, even though it performs what it's supposed to perform. Let's keep it real here. We can lower the price and still get great performance. It doesn't have to be a $1,600, $1,900, $2,000 card unless you are greedy as a company. Now I'm never going to get any sponsorships from pretty much anybody. Um, it, I mean, <laughs> cause I kind of, I put in my perspective of things and it tends to be consumer centric, not business. I'm not a fanboy of any business. Um, I will walk away, uh, because there's zero loyalty from the company providing this, whatever it is they're providing. So, you know, what I want is competitive technology that is providing us superior products and superior service. We don't get either of those really, unless we are spending 2000 or more dollars. Um, you know, you, well, let's, uh, I'll just stop right there. Um, and again, this article is over at the verge.com follow the link through hometown. You can go and check it out. Um, but they've got the pricing for the 750, 770, and the limited edition 770. Uh, the A750 is starting at 289. The uh, A770 8 gig is starting at 329. And the A770 limited edition at 16 gigs is starting at 349. Now these, I could purchase these all day long. This would be fine. Um, I mean, I'll even look into, well... <laughs> I say a lot of things really fast and then my filter kicks in It's still not clear which card manufacturers beyond itself will uh, build these latest arc GPUs though. Intel lists a bunch of partners on its website, but mostly our OEMs only Asus, uh, gigabyte MSI actually make GPUs, uh, but they also make laptops. Um, yeah, I'm not sure who all will end up making these and adding value to it. Uh, kind of like what NVIDIA does and what AMD does. The problem with what NVIDIA has done lately, though, is their last announcement completely obliterated the partnership concept because only they knew what their pricing was going to be to the vendors, and they didn't tell the vendors until after they announced their own product offering, um, which kind of is... Uh, uh, screw you got mine. Oh, and now you can start ramping up your pricing because you didn't know what that chip was going to cost, even though you're supposed to be a partner and get reference v uh, chips and know what the price is going to be on the day that we announce it. And you can actually have the product in the, in the chain. That's not what NVIDIA did. Um, and, uh, it really pissed off a lot of, um, partners, partners, um, more like victims at this point. But again, that's my hot take on this. Let's move on to the next article. Uh, soon you can buy a uh, Peloton at Dick's Sporting Goods. If you are not here, I don't know if Dick's is overseas as well, but here in the States, Dick's Sporting Goods is a place. It's kind of like a big box store for sports. Um, there's Home Depot, which is big box for home supplies and building, um, whatever it might be for builders and small home, or I should say like home repair and stuff like that. That's what Home Depot is and Lowe's. Um, Dick's is the, I think one of the first 
big box sports related and more general. So I'm not surprised that Peloton is going to Dick's Sporting Goods um, only because they have had to change their 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 model. They they don't have exclusivity, really. Um, they have to get out in force and in people's faces. I think what's going to end up happening is Peloton is going to continue to um, struggle because people don't want to be burdened by the $5,000 bike price. Now they have um, a rowing machine. Uh, they have this uh, expensive membership. They're very aggressive in their social network stuff so that when you are riding a Peloton, you are engaged in a class and it's highly competitive, like uh, people against people, which is fine. It promotes engagement and it makes things fun for those who are competitive. Um, others can just like take part, but not really engage in that level. Uh, but it says here in August, Peloton partnered with Amazon to sell its bikes and other accessories and apparel via the retailer's website and apps. Uh, today, Peloton announced another partnership with Dick's Sporting Goods to sell its equipment both online and exclusively, whatever that means. I mean, if it's selling to Amazon exclusively in stores across the U.S., that doesn't really amount to much people aren't really going to stores when they can get stuff online and it's neuter in terms of personalization. They don't need to go to a store. They can just order it from Dick's Sporting Goods online or Amazon online. Amazon, if it's a prime solution, a, a prime offering, will get it for free. Dick's is going to charge you. Um, as far as I know, they don't necessarily have a level where it's okay to send a $5,000 bike without paying for shipping. They might even require like white glove service, um, like with the tonal. I bought a tonal, it's sitting on my wall. Um, I had to pay for the white glove service uh, for it to be installed. It is what it is. Um, great device, by the way. So it says here, the move to expand its fitness lineup to physical stores beyond the ones Peloton operates isn't surprising. It's continuing a plan to improve operations. I don't know if there will be enough runway ha. or cycleway paths. I I'm not sure. I don't, I don't see um, Peloton surviving as this exclusive uh, elite solution. Jasmine Hicks is the author of this article and it says here, this is the first time Peloton will be available in store from an outside retailer. In August, Peloton started selling its bikes, treadmills, and other workout gear uh, via Amazon. Now, I'm surprised that they don't, I guess other workout gear might be referring to their, they just released um, a rowing machine, which is several thousand dollars. Um, supposedly, you know, it's a good deal, but it has a massive carbon footprint. Uh, if you have it and your Peloton and uh, even the treadmill, you're looking at like close to 10 grand, I think. Let's see if there's something else in here. Whoa. Um, yeah, not really. New partnership, current and potential Peloton customers can buy the Peloton bike, bike plus, which is the bike tread guide and select accessories but they never mind I, I i'll leave it alone maybe it was announced but i've actually seen the device i don't know let's move on to the next article um this is in the warcrafters channel and we're going to reach back a little bit to that rtx 4090 graphics card um, this is one of the articles that caught my eye. I had already heard about this, um, but NVIDIA's biggest and boldest card to date, the RTX 4090, is set to release on October 12th for $1,600. Let's just round up. So the article is titled, How Much? This third-party RTX 4090 graphics card uh, is already $2,000 or more. Um, well, over on German retailer Case King, you'll find the Zotac Gaming GeForce RTX 4090 Amp Extreme Arrow. It's 
quite the sentence there. Um, do you, how many shirts do you think we could probably put what nine of us together and have that in bold letters, just enough to fit on the backs of us uh, for an eye watering 2,279 Euro, which is pretty much at parity right now with the U S dollar. Um, it's a lovely looking car, mm, sorry, card. The author was just thinking about how they spent the same amount of money on their car. My first car was a $500 vehicle that when it got too close to water, the uh, a propeller would appear uh, and uh, descend uh, in preparation for entering the water. And I could probably put uh, a VW bus in the back of it. Yet, for air conditioning, the floorboards were rusted out so much that um, air would come up through the floorboards. But the reason why I say this is because still <laughs> I got $500 and I bought a vehicle that took me from point A to point B and now a tiny little graphics card, which isn't necessarily necessary, right? You don't need it. Um, it's more a feather in our cap as gamers and maybe streamers, um, might use it for just streaming, which is interesting, but it's a fast card. Um, but certainly I don't think as a consumer worth $2,000 or even $1,600. Um, again, the consumers need to put some downward pressure on these companies, record profits, folks during pandemics, um, struggling to get components and, um, supply chain issues and, and all of that and still record profits. And it's because of stuff like this. So over in the U S new egg has the ASUS GeForce RTX 4090, 24 gigabyte ROG Strix OC again, hell of a name folks listed for $2,000. The author was initially surprised as to the price of this card. Um, MSI is one of the water-cooled Supreme Liquid GPU going for $1,750, but then it's uh, the Strix model, and they've always run for a higher cost. But $2,000? Oh, let me do something. There we go. Um, boom. So Jacob Ridley over at PCGamer.com says, I dread to think how much they'll cost once retailers or resellers get their hands on them retail selling for two thousand dollars do you think this exclusivity this artificial scarcity as i think this is um, is going to end up actually manifesting three thousand dollar cards it's a graphics card and the manufacturer themselves is saying yeah, we agree with this. It's like surge pricing for something. Hey, we're going to charge you $2,500 for a card that normally sells any other day for peak level $1,299. That's like the top of the line. Now, though, eh, all bets are off. The last three years have shown just how greedy uh, companies can be. And again, I'll say it again. If you've ever been in my chat and or watched this stream or heard this podcast, I am a capitalist. I've I'm I've got five products right now that I'm developing um, that I will eventually announce here on the stream and either send it over to Kickstarter or launch my own Kickstarter platform, um, which is certainly doable. I'm I actually have a, a site ready to go. Um, but I cannot see myself saying, Hey, I'm going to charge, you know, $250 for an item that people will want, but I can still get it. I can still make profit without being an un to me, an unethical capitalist. I know. Leaving money on the table, it's downright a crime, right? Let's move on to the next article. 
Um, this next article is an interview talking to Johnny Garrett of William Wood Watches on transitioning from Kickstarter project to self-sustained brand. This is one of these things where it's really interesting because uh, Kickstarter is almost like having a prototype device. Um, it gets capitalized and then you send it out to the people that funded it. Now, is it going to be the best of the best? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, I've supported, I think, somewhere around 30 Kickstarter projects. Um, I, uh, a few of them have bit me really, really hard. Um, I actually have, and what's really interesting about that is I'm not, I don't really poo-poo the idea of Kickstarter. I do poo-poo the idea of people thinking that it's a store and that you're purchasing something. Um, no, you're actually funding a project that has considerable risk and in times like the pandemic uh, it could completely wet the bed and that has actually happened with a couple of projects that i was engaged in uh, over at kickstarter and uh, one that's still underway uh, at least the one on kickstarter has kind of bowed back a little bit and said hey our commercial side is doing great but that thing that you funded isn't doing so hot so uh, we'll get back to you on that. But the one on the on Indiegogo that I funded recently, um, <laughs> they've been saying all kinds of stuff going on in their production. So Kickstarter pivoting over to a self-sustained brand is quite the coup. So let's just go straight over to the article. And it's over at monochrome-watches.com, which is really referred to as just monochrome. Uh, Robert... Robin Nui or Noy, I'm not sure how they pronounce their last name, um, is the uh, author and interviewer for this. And these are the watches. And uh, William Wood Watches is the brand. They have this um, limited edition one. And you have to account for a whole lot more when you're doing a Kickstarter because there are levels of um, <laughs> financial burden that most people, when they are listening about a Kickstarter or engaged in a Kickstarter, don't really know. Um, you know, that Amazon takes a piece, Kickstarter takes a piece, taxes are still due for all of this. Um, and you have to pay the people that are going to be doing uh, the fulfillment on this. So you're going to have to pay them. And that price m may vary from what you put in your Kickstarter and changing your prices basically means having to do another tier, not necessarily, it would be impossible to go back and say, sorry, um, your price is this now because our manufacturer says that there's a 15% increase. Nope. Uh, the objective here now is sell as much as you can, create another uh, strata of or tier uh, of purchasers and hope that you can re recover some of that 15% loss that's going to cut into your profits. Um, and uh, maybe even on the Kickstarter, uh, your initial price is much higher because you're making a, an exclusive to Kickstarter product. Um, so going again from Kickstarter to self-sustained is quite the coup. Um, I had mentioned a while back uh, how going from a prototype vehicle to actually manufacturing a retail vehicle um, is a very, very complex and expensive experience. Not many people can actually make that happen. And they go through this um, history of this and, and talk about how they actually make this possible. So one of the things they say here is, second, the fact that you get backing from early backers and potential long-term clients, you can grow a database of future releases. Uh, they pushed as hard as they could through their personal network and noticed that during the second campaign, it paid off much more than the first and their split between what they raised on Kickstarter versus what they generated from their own mailing list was 3% Kickstarter, 97% self-generated. Um, 
literally the embodiment of what Kickstarter is. Kickstarter is designed to um, basically incubate your product launch and use the value of the brand of Kickstarter. And that's what you pay them for. Uh, not to mention the billing process, gathering all of the data and so on, uh, so that you can fulfill. It's much harder to do on your own. So that's why there aren't that many Kickstarters and Kickstarter clones. Although they are out there. Indiegogo, for instance, is another one. So not bad, right? Um, if you want to read more about how they made it happen and uh, their perspective of things, uh, follow that link. Uh, the next article is a trove of Elon Musk's texts. texts have been released and somebody went through it. So you don't have to. And it wasn't me. Um, this is a Business Insider article. Um, happy Friday readers is what. Uh, Business Insider says, and the air is getting cold, cooler and Spirit Halloween is invading big box retailers. Uh, if you don't know about Spirit Halloween, it's quite interesting to see them pop up out of nowhere. Um, today, they're looking back at a simpler time. And Musk has a bunch of discussions with a bunch of investors and very wealthy people willing to throw around a text that says, yeah, I'll invest 5 billion in your project to purchase Twitter and, you know, democratize it. Hello, Seven. How are you doing? We'll have to have a conversation. I'm really curious about Seven Heavy Steel. Is it something that I know is it's a riff off of something that I know and I'm not, I'm not seeing the connection. I deal with like manufacturing and stuff like, Oh really? Is it seven heavy steel? I'm just now learning to play guitar. Um, so yeah, I'm having a, a problem like most people that, that are learning guitar. Oh, seven strings, heavy gauge, steel wound. Right on. Thanks. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, there. Uh, if you've never played guitar, um, uh, try. It's it's really fun. It also shows the weakness of the human being. <laughs> uh, not to get sidetracked from this Elon Musk tax, but that's how it rolls here. Um, when you first start getting into guitar, um, you'll, your fingers might go numb, um, <laughs> and your memory, uh, it, well, maybe it's my age, uh, showing here, but memorizing all of the notes on a guitar and the chords themselves to the point where it can be more innate and you don't have to sit there and kind of uh, where do my fingers need to be? Um, all of this combined has shown just, I think how weak I am, uh, learning guitar. You're not supposed to memorize them at all. We'll have to talk. <laughs> it's supposed to be muscle memory, right? But you have to know what you're doing. Uh, to me, what makes sense is learning the sound. Learning the sound is really what is uh, making this enjoyable. Uh, learning chords and, and learning, you know, the, the, the notes themselves, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah, you just need to learn the root notes and you need mechanical skills. Yep. And strong fingers and calloused fingertips. Um, otherwise, you are going to sand your hand <laughs> down to a nub. And maybe it's going to look like a crime scene. Um, so, yeah, I'm doing my best. Yeah. That's awesome. So, thanks. It shed some light into your name. So, I appreciate you talking with me about it. 
Yeah, around 20 minutes. Yeah, that's what I do. A little bit a day. Um, and I've got two guitars and acoustic over here that has um, electric capabilities. And I got a cigar box guitar because that's what I really want to learn. So I dabble with both. I will probably never be on Twitch playing the guitar, but <clears throat> maybe in 10 years. And then I'll just pass away quietly. The guitar will stop playing and my camera will go dark. That'll be my last stream. Right on. Appreciate it. I don't know enough to even ask questions. So thanks for offering. Um, so Seven Heavy shared uh, a, a few um, statements about <laughs> entry-level guitar. So... You need rhythm, like a beat, not just a clicker. Yeah, I don't even do that. Uh, I'm I'm basically trying, I hear a song and I pull it into my head and I try and keep going like that. Um, and I'm not trying to be anybody. I'm trying to uh, just to learn where it is. Um, and get that muscle memory because, uh, you know, on the guitar, everything is static until you change the tuning um, or something is wrong. Um, and you can instantly hear a bad note. A lot of I, I'm not sure if a lot of people really know about that. But um, to me, if I hit a wrong note, man, that thing is like a an, a cold breeze across your brain. Um, sorry, everybody uh, who might, I, I'm not going to remove this from the stream. I'm not going to remove this from the podcast. You, you get to hear all of this. Um, so seven heavy steel um, is sharing some information and like, uh, there's a right and a wrong way to practice and, uh, and how you practice changes with time. Yeah. Because then you can stop focusing on the other things because it's become muscle memory. Yeah. I get that. And uh, muscle memory comes with time. Yeah. Pretty much like driving, pretty much anything skill wise, um, but it it's it's quite fun, and uh, I don't envy anybody within earshot of me playing or practicing. Yeah, right on. Yeah, I wish I would have done this earlier, and I'm trying to push my son into uh, learning an instrument, so he kind of digs the guitar. Um, but we'll see. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, easily distracted folks. That's how, that's how I am. And, um, we always learn something when we get this kind of discussion going and yesterday's discussion, uh, was awesome. So learn root notes, understood, learn positions, understood, and learn pentatonic co uh, scale, understood. Yep. I'm on it. Um, yeah, I, sorry. Okay, so uh, this link that I threw into chat links to a trove of Elon Musk texts that have been analyzed uh, by Business Insider. I won't go into great detail about this, but it's really just a conversation amongst the ultra rich um, with kind of a soft glove discussion about Twitter being compromised um, and not really open to free discussion and that bots are controlling a lot and what those bots do uh, isn't really discussed. Um, but somehow Twitter is um, deemed a target for uh, acquisition by Musk to take it private, pivot it, remove uh, these bots and somehow make it freer, open to discussion, but not tainted by some uh, political um, angle, right? Uh, but I'm telling you from the research that I have done, as more people gravitate towards a particular thing, be it a business, be it a um, uh, geographic region, like a city, a state, etc., and you can look, just look at a map. You can see Empirically, when more people gravitate to a place, it becomes what those people are. And my research shows that nine times out of 10, when it hits a high enough population density within a region, it becomes democratic. It becomes pro-LGBTQ. It becomes pro 
um, you can read or listen to whatever you want. It becomes a, a menagerie of everything. It becomes um, more uh, inclusive. It becomes more equitable. It becomes pretty much everything uh, open, uh, arms wide open. Um, but as you skirt away from these population density uh, areas, it becomes less and less democratic. And I, I will eventually discuss this uh, in a more, once I have all of my ducks in a row and I, I'm more comfortable with uh, discussing it. Um, but Twitter is that massive population uh, a diaspora of people. There's so many people on Twitter, regardless of the bots. I've seen those bots. I've seen discussions about these bots, um, having conversations and manipulating conversations by injecting their pre-programmed content, hyping something up or trying to discount some personality or a discussion or whatever. Is it real? Absolutely. Are they the end all be all and tainting Twitter's in complete integrity down to the core? I don't know. And I don't think anybody truly has the ability to know what is a Twitter bot versus a human unless they find somebody they suspect and then they watch them and they watch them and they watch them. But when something is tweeting out 15 tweets in a minute and you find out that it's your president instead of a bot and the content of those tweets doesn't necessarily make sense. Now, if you don't know it's a bot, then does it matter? That's kind of the core question that I have, but Elon Musk and others who want to take it private, the objective is to take it private, remove the bots, not sure how they're going to do it, and then bring it back public. Um, and they think that they can do it without, they can do it better without a board and without oversight, but really it's about concentrating that wealth, power, influence. And then because there's no oversight, there's no board, there's no plurality of people that might come forward except whistleblowers. And we know how big business treats whistleblowers, um, government included, how much is going to get disclosed openly. How much transparency? You don't take a business private because you want it transparent. You take a business private because you want to make sure that you control every aspect of it. So that's what these tweets really go into. There's some interesting graphics and whatnot, but, um, but when you go through the link and I'll post it again, um, when you go through this link and you go over to the article, there's another link embedded in here and it's, here's what we found. And that's the one that goes into greater detail, not this initial one. Um, but I, my aggregator only grabbed this, um, within the last 24 hours. The other one is a little bit older, so we'll move on. And if you are interested in this kind of thing, uh, feel free to click on the show note that will take you over to, uh, the article. Um, which actually has a link to another article um, from The Verge, not from Business Insider, uh, that talks about, uh, rest in peace, Google Stadia, the latest news on the discontinued cloud gaming service. This one is a little bit less uh, opinion and more about the latest developments of the service. So I won't really go into it. Um, I'll post the link and um, you can follow it. It'll be in the show notes as well. Uh, but st- uh, Stadia will shut down January 18th, 2023. So very little notice to anybody. Um, and, uh, so seven, you said, um, you didn't know about it as in, you didn't know that Stadia existed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I- I'm not surprised. Um, I thought Stadia was for the longest time when it was being discussed, I thought Stadia was, um, Nvidia's solution, not Google. Well, anyway, Stadia is shutting down. They, they seem to do perpetual beta testing. So 
so you have a large percentage of your life invested in video games and and um, and being good at games so are you a console player or are you a pc player um this article over at the verge that i linked in chat about stadia closing down is actually by verge staff <laughs> yes <laughs> seven says yes uh, to my question well that's interesting so do you stream too um so despite coming to a close which many predicted given google's tendency to kill projects instead of letting them fizzle out google arguably succeeded at delivering on its promise of bringing cloud game streaming to a bunch of screens before microsoft sony and amazon had formal plans to do the same um, and I'm surprised that Google wouldn't make this more of a software as a service to other people. Um, why not make the license this technology to others um, so that they can uh, put their game on it and and drive traffic to it and uh, maybe even the architecture be offered over to Sony and Microsoft and Amazon, although Amazon doesn't need Google. You press go live. So sometimes you do, huh? Um, let's see. So they go back to the beginning of um, Stadia as a timeline, I suppose. Stadia was a good beta test for the future of gaming. Remembering all the, oh, so there are articles that they talk about. Remembering all those times Google uh, said it was committed to Stadia. Yeah, I I don't buy into anything really um, from Google in terms of the longevity. I know they know and, and I know and many people know really where their um, uh, cash cow is and that is their their software as a service, all of it, right? Office related stuff um, and their search and um, YouTube basically, which their search is really the, 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 the meat and potatoes of it. So this next article, and it's the last one for today and is one of the reasons why I'm really interested in um, well, what amounts to what I refer to as um, reality hacking. Um, back 30 years ago, uh, without putting a date on me, um, and just saying 30 years means a lot. I mean, there's a lot of tech, a lot of evolution, a lot of um, skill and, and development and fundamental research and all kinds of money thrown around. Um, this idea that we are uh, approaching a point where the uncanny valley is being traversed. We're just skimming right over it now. We're not in the uncanny valley. We are trending towards the other side of that valley and bringing back the, the real. You know, there's an area where we accept it, but it isn't human looking. It isn't interactive to the point where we say, yeah, it's a human being. We accept mechanical, robotic, um, even the tinny voice we accept. Um, but we get really creeped out with going from that metallic robot type of concept of a person to a hyper-realistic person if it isn't done perfectly, right? Well video and audio and other things i mean the the interaction and all of that the personality is is being developed uh, we haven't gotten to the point where you know, the real world has these um newer on the other side of the valley accepted robotics um but this will kind of creepy out um, we're getting to the point where AI video generators can actually do much more beyond, um, what we have seen in history and that's reality hacking. We, we can 
fake audio. We can fake video. We can generate people. Um, there's an actor that just signed to allow his entire person to be replicated as an artificial uh, entity for acting. Um, and I, it slipped my mind who it was uh, just now, but um, that person now will be modeled in three dimensions and uh, injected into commercials, maybe movies. Yes. Um, all kinds of stuff. Um, but then we could take it one step further and create completely artificial um, this person does not exist. And I don't know if you have ever seen that. Um, there's a website called this person does not exist. And it takes pictures from all kinds of places and then seamlessly merges them together to create a picture of a person. And it's very easy to take that flat picture and wrap it around a 3d model. And suddenly you have a person um, making the face move and micro tells and things like that, that make us approach it a little easier, um, is really where AI and machine learning, um, is going to go. And eventually we will have fully, uh, authentic looking human actors that are completely computer generated. And the people that own them are the people that created them. They will have copyright over those artistic works. Um, whereas now we're paying millions of dollars for an actor to do something. A side effect is there will be no, uh, fan base, you know, people, uh, crawling across broken glass just to stare up at a person, um, who they believe is famous and that they are in love with, you know, the, the, the fan base that chased Johnny Depp around, um, during the trial or Amber Heard, um, it can all go away, uh, because people will be watching movies for the, maybe the entertainment and not the person within it. Um, I don't know if that will ever happen in my lifetime, but if you don't, if you can't tell the difference, you know, the, the paparazzi would go away. Um, things like the red carpet would go away. Um, events like, uh, uh, well, I mean, there's, there's many events, but, uh, uh, events for, um, awards ceremonies and stuff like that would go away. It would all just be now we are watching, um, movies for movies sake and not the people that are embodied in them. Um, maybe prices will drop for stuff. I don't know. Um, but this is all AI generated by meta. Now I think they're, um, taking over the metaverse concept. Um, I, I hate the idea of what they're doing. Um, but this is quite intriguing. So seven says hyper-realistic cartoons with spontaneous, intelligent dialogue, uh, question mark. Uh, yeah. Um, but not cartoons. Um, they would be synthetic entities in virtual space when it gets to that level, but, uh, the two dimensional screen, but they would look and interact in their composited space as if they are three dimensional solid beings. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I suppose because it's generated and synthetic, then yeah, you could refer to it as a cartoon, but, um, cartoons would be more interactive than ever before. Um, uh, pretty much anything that right now exists as, uh, pre-planned whatever, like this stream, if done right with the right technology, I could, you, you might think that I'm a human being, but I'm actually synthetic. I just have a very elaborate high resolution, um, image and all of my compute resources, um, are being concentrated into this tiny little screen. 
and my artificial intelligence engine is a, a natural speech neural engine that's capable of responding in rapid fire based on the input of what my chat is and what I have gleaned from the article. And I can do it faster than a human being, but maybe, maybe I might glitch out periodically and get distracted by something, right? So Seven says, well, then there would be no need uh, to be confined to the human form, correct? That's what this bear is. This bear is in a suit and, and reaching for something and then it resets. Um, well, that's meta and meta is meta does as much research as an academic institution, but they do it with a full focus of trying to convert it into a business experience, um, a, a profit seeking experience. Whereas, uh, schools, although some will argue and, 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 um, say, well, schools are profitable. Yeah. Well, they actually burn quite through, uh, burn quite a bit of money in the process of fundamental research, and it is a loss. And science shouldn't be pursued simply for the objective of making a profit. Um, it just might be a side effect of proving something not consistent with the reality of physics or biology or society or whatever else, and that is deemed a loss to a lot of people in schools, but it's really academic institutions are not supposed to be truly profitable in what they do, what they output, um, but that might generate revenue as a side effect. That's again, my take on academia though. Um, so seven also says, um, I think it's applications would go way beyond human performance unless these constructs have, uh, pathos or pathos, um, gravitas and empathy based off of talent, skill, and experience. Uh, I don't know if there's more there. Um, but yes, that's, it, that's exactly where I'm taking this discussion that if you cannot tell because they are embodying that pathos, that gravitas, that empathy, they're exposing themselves when they quote unquote act, but it's really a script and very intelligently developed uh, facial movements and can generate tears and make a voice crack at the right inflection point. We are getting to that point. We're not there yet. It could be 10 years, 20 years, but we are trending that way. So seven heavy steel says, um, well, very few will buy it. It's why voice actors are integral to the animation and video industry. A human does not need to be seen on screen to deliver a mind blowing uh, performance. It would be like watching Shakespeare performed entirely by psychopaths. Um, well, psychopaths actually have, uh, well, depending on the, where they are on the gamut of psychopaths, they do have the ability to do emotional responses, but, um, I get what you're saying. And voice actors have all of that because they are real world actors somewhere else and they have that following and that's why they get selected um, for being a voice actor. And uh, again, I when I do my talks, when I uh, when I discuss this with people, I have the caveat of saying, don't think about right now. Think about five years, 10 years, 20 years in the future. You know, I may be gone, um, but society is still here and we are taking our technology and evolving it much faster than the human race is. Um, and therein lies the rub in that we will create synthetic beings um, that will outlive us all and have a copyright that extends well beyond our lives. In fact, it's a, I, I think right now it's 127 years past the life of the copyright holder. When I die, my family still has the rights to my works. So they want to create, create an, uh, so seven heavy steel says, so they want to create AI to perform as AI for AI meta living up to its name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
artificial intelligence uh, evolves so much faster than human beings and our graphics engines uh, like mid journey and dolly um, evolve much faster and the works that i see coming out of mid journey and dolly i have subscriptions to both of them now um, is mind-blowing and all it takes is to wireframe them in to a 3d model and it can skin the whole thing um, and be animated uh, and it can be fantastical stuff. Uh, there was somebody that uh, just today in the Discord for Mid Journey um, posted trolls of various kinds. And I can see that uh, it's super real or hyper realistic. Um, I could see it in a movie um, with a voice and, and personality traits and everything. And that is the embodiment of the channel that I want to bring. Um, it's going to have to happen next year. I can't do it right now. Um, but I will start, um, a, it's already in existence. Um, it's called reality hacker and it is the, the show that will talk about this stuff, um, for about an hour, uh, once a week. Um, while the hometown daily news show will persist at 6 PM, I will do reality hacker either before or after it, um, on a day, uh, sometime during the week. I'm not quite sure just yet. Um, but reality hacker is one of the ones that will be coming, um, along with, uh, at least three more. Um, so I'm trying not to overwhelm myself with the pivot. Um, uh, and I'm, I continue to look for hosts and co-hosts, um, but just to, to pull it back into where we were with this article, um, this is a product of some coder or network of coders, a whole team dedicated to evolving AI. And when we go to sleep, AI is still chugging away and evolving and doing its own um, user experience analysis of this uh, how it, it is self-generating another composite and saying, is this one superior to the last one? It's doing it all inside its computer screen, uh, not in its screen. It's, it's doing everything inside its container. It's Docker, wherever it is, that AI is just grinding away and trying to make sure that it is always evolving while the developers of it are actually sleeping. Um, because we suffer from getting tired and getting drunk or stoned or stupid or getting in the car and having a bad day and taking a turn too fast and wiping out and ending up in the hospital or we break up with a significant other and again have a bad day or the flip side we are irrationally exuberant and we make poor life choices and gamble well gamble away our life savings ai does none of that and even if you were to program it to flame out like that, all you have to do is restart it. It's very hard to do that with humans. Um, one wrong move with a human means that you lose that entire silo of skill, knowledge, abilities, wisdom, etc. Yeah, the human condition is frail, even though we're adaptive as we fail. Um, but AI and machine learning and computer graphics and all of that, we can always make it better and better and better at a speed that completely eclipses human uh, capabilities, which is ironic because we're the ones that make this. And at some point I can be a hyper-realistic VTuber. I probably wouldn't look like this. Um, but that hyper-realistic element is coming to a channel near you and uh, it's born from stuff like this. They say Meta's AI video generator tool is already giving me nightmares, uh, but I see the beauty in this. I see the future in this. I see us ending up in a space like Westworld, hopefully without the whatever is going on in Westworld now. I don't know if anybody's watched this recently, um, but it is really wacky. Um, somewhere along the line, we ended up going from a possible computer virus to some black goo that is infecting humans of some kind. I'm not quite sure 
it hinted at the end of the last season and then in this season sorry i i say last season season three i think it is season four is really off the wall um and i don't know if there's going to be another season but at any rate um i don't want to spoil or anything if you're into that kind of thing but at the beginning of the the westworld series they asked the most important question if if you can't tell the difference between what is real and fake, doesn't matter. You have no idea until somebody tells you. Um, and I've done this with people. I've, I've said that I, uh, seven, I am too. I, I am immune to spoilers. It doesn't really change the nature of the, uh, surprise. I don't know if it's really kind of like a, uh, subtle flex, but I usually see the, <clears throat> I see the spoiler before it actually happens anyway. Um, but it's still fun. I enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to say that. Um, I too. Seven says, uh, I can enjoy things regardless and it often gives me something to look forward to. Yep. I'm the exact same way. So great minds. Um, I'll put myself in your company. So Okay, so with all of this in mind, again, you know, we we live in this holistic world and uh, I don't like siloing myself in one particular area of interest, which is why I created hometown.com and opened it up to the public. Um, awesome. Thanks, Heavy. I really appreciate it. Uh, seven Heavy Steel, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, and so the, the reason why I created hometown and made it public is because I really just don't focus on one particular thing. Um, I find it kind of, um, limiting. Um, and so I'm a fan of everything in moderation. Uh, there are areas of interest that I go down a deeper, uh, hole, four and that is business technology and society those are the three where my academic and professional pursuits have generated the most uh time in grade if you're if you work for the government you're familiar with that if you work for academia you're familiar with that time in grade um has led me to understand things and their interconnectedness at times and with conversation with other people expanded my wisdom so I really appreciate people coming to my chat and talking with me in real time. Um, it allows me to reach well beyond my geographic boundaries. And um, there is a, um, a Japanese uh, scarecrow, what do you call it? Um, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Um, it's a called a Shinto Kami. That's right. So K A M I. Um, and it's, uh, a, a Kami called, uh, Kuabiko, which is basically a scarecrow that has persisted in that place, whatever it is, that one spot for so long that it has accrued the world's knowledge. And that's what I believe that, uh, streaming and hanging out online and searching the web for stuff. The web naturally aggregates content in itself, and then we have to go out and find it. Um, and so I hope to be similar to Kuabiko, um, wherein I can gather up the world's knowledge and be able to talk about it. And that's what happens with Kuabiko. The story goes, um, a traveler comes and, and has a discussion with Kuabiko because they have all of the knowledge and can tell people where they can go. Um, sometimes I say it in colorful language where people can go. <laughs> um, but here I would really like more people to come and hang out and um, have uh, real uh, conversations, casual conversations, not, um, you know, arguments and name calling and all of that kind of stuff. And, um, Lately, with uh, like Seven Heavy Steel coming and um, Lunchbox coming and others that have um, followed me. And then when the alert goes out, we meet, which is awesome. And I see you in other channels, which is awesome. Um, 
maybe we can grow a little maybe we see everything eye to eye but that's great i uh, you know i'll share a beer with you anytime um, but even through our differences conversation is what matters and that's what hometown is all about that conversation community um, but still being open honest and have a discussion um, yeah just like i do too i just like hanging out to be honest that's, uh, I spent one day, one day in the restaurant world. Um, I was given a $50 tip and told get out of the industry because I acted more like the owner of the business. Um, I sat down with people and had conversations and everybody loved it except for this one person. And I took it as kind of guidance that I wasn't cut out for, um, working in the food service industry because I was so easily distracted by uh, wanting to hang out and talk with the people uh, because and I would be invited to have a conversation it wasn't like I just kind of injected myself into the world even though you know by the nature of food service you do they were like hey come and sit down and have a conversation because I was having conversations with other people um, so yeah I'm into the conversation and hanging out and uh, a lot of people kind of treat me as a bartender uh, when I'm standing in lines somewhere or uh, walking along the street. Somebody will, you know, just today, somebody said that they loved my shirt and we ended up having a 15 minute conversation uh, before I had uh, my wife show up for lunch. And um, and now I'm friends with the restaurant owner. <laughs> they kind of gave me a deep dive about how they pick their place. Um, so it, it's it's really important to have conversations and not just blast each other because of some political perspective um, or social ambition of some kind or uh, you're a noob kind of language and stuff like that. Sure, you can trash talk me in a game, um, but turn it off when you come into the channel and have a conversation. If I'm blowing it when I start streaming games, I'm cool with backseat gaming or backseat comments. Um, backseat driving as it is um, but it it needs to be without the vitriol and sometimes I'll say something just I'll, I will be upset about some things right um, and that's kind of like well we're all in this house together and sometimes somebody does have a real serious bone to pick um, but it's really all conversation and everybody should be cool with it um, we are it's all about what we do, not necessarily just what we say, but what we do with what we say. Um, okay, with all that in mind, I really do appreciate you all coming. And um, we'll have another conversation tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, yeah, I'm just not feeling up to snuff today. Um, but I really do enjoy being here. And um, I'll miss you until... 6 p.m. when I hope to get to see you again. Thanks for coming. And again, sorry, if you are listening to this via the podcast and you made it this far, uh, thanks for listening through all of the, as Heavy says, banter. Yep. Peace. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.